Good evening and welcome to the continuation of our Pride Perspective series, where we share conversations with our community. And tonight we have a very special program for you featuring our alumni and one of our parents who are all in the music industry and moderated, moderated by our very own Chris Kelsey, who is director of instrumental music and a professional musician himself. So this is going to be a great program. We, we're so glad you're a part of it. And um, I will get started in just a moment, but just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, after introductions, we'll be answering the questions that were submitted by the registrations. And um, unfortunately, due to a scheduling conflict, one of our panelists is not able to join, but uh, we'll try to answer her questions um, throughout. We have emailed her and, and may have some answers for you. Um, and also, as the conversation unfolds, if you have additional questions, just uh, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will get to them. If we don't get to them this evening, um, we will email you uh, the answers. So. So thanks again for joining, and I will pass the baton uh, to Chris Kelsey. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone listening and also our guest, uh, Debbie Gibbs, owner of Just Managing, uh, John Kasha, uh, a regional marketing director at Atlantic Records, and Courtney Ness Clyburn, a uh, hip-hop producer who... Um, I, I should tell everyone, Courtney was a TP grad in 15, John uh, graduated in 01, and Debbie's son, Blake Ellis, is a current senior at TP. So I thought we'd start out um, by uh, asking, first of all, what, um, how you, uh, if, ask each of you to describe your, uh, your work and uh, a little bit of the background that led you to where you are now. Uh, Debbie, could, could you take that? Sure. Um, so Just Managing is an agency for record producers. Um, they're mainly uh, indie rock producers. Um, we produced records by people like the Foo Fighters and Nine Inch Nails, um, Kings of Leon, uh, those kinds of artists. Um, how I got here was uh, a circu circuitous journey. I started out, I was in architecture school and at the um, student radio station. I became very involved in the college station. I think that um, back in my day, that was a frequent um, path into the music industry. Um, I was a DJ on a daily basis and I ended up becoming the station manager and then um, uh, uh, gave myself a retirement gig as, as marketing manager. And in that process, I was um, organizing uh, gigs for the, that the station promoted and um, became good friends with a lot of musicians. I started managing a couple of my friends' bands. Um, one of those bands I signed to Arista Records here in New York um, and Alma Irving Publishing. And we had a booking agent in New York and I spent a lot of time here uh, organizing their releases and tours and so forth, um, fell in love with the city. And when the band uh, disbanded five years later, um, I decided to uh, move to the States. And at that time, a good friend of mine who's, who's one of her clients had mixed some of the singles for the band I managed. Um, she was pregnant, having a new baby, didn't want to travel to the States anymore. So I started out actually representing her producers here in um, in America. A couple of them ended up moving here and um, I ended up building my own roster of record producers from there. Um, and I now have a dozen, 10 to 12 at a time. Um, and, and, uh, and I act as an agent essentially for them. Chris, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to get used to this. Um, you're from New Zealand, that's right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you came here from uh, New Zealand. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about you, John? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently based in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up not too far from Trinity Pauling in Westchester. Um, right now, I'm the regional promotion manager for Atlantic Records. I've been doing this for about 13 years. Um, you know, I travel around the Southeast trying to get records played. I'm lucky enough to get to work with some of the biggest artists in the world, like Bruno Mars and Ed Sheeran, Charlie Puth, Lizzo, uh, currently working a project by Coldplay. Um, 
you know, uh, lots of other artists that you guys have all heard of before, um, been really lucky over the last 13 years, how I got here. Um, I started in radio. Um, I was going to college after Trinity Pauling. I moved to Florida for college um, and got my first gig as a part-time promotions person. I was the guy putting up tents on the weekend, handing out t-shirts, um, you know, living on my friend's couch and uh, just worked my way up. I did radio sales, got back into promotion, um, worked down in Miami for a station called Y100 and just kind of worked my way up the ranks. And after a few years of doing radio promotion, I got tapped on the shoulder by Atlantic, um, went up to New York, interviewed for the job two weeks later, started working for Atlantic. And uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. It's been an, an amazing 13 years getting to work records and asking for radio airplay, creating unique marketing plans, and uh, you know, just, just having a good time running around the Southeast and, and the Gulf Coast. Cool, thank you. Uh, how about you, Ness? How you doing, y'all? My name is Ness. Um, I'm based out of Rochester, New York. I started making music around sixth grade. That's when I got really introduced to creating music. My dad actually introduced me to a program called FL Studio. And ever since I've been introduced to that, I've been working on it. And I really started, I've been making beats for 12 years. I don't know if I mentioned that, I'm sorry. I'm running around, but been making music for 12 years. I really use um, Twitter and Instagram to really network and connect with different artists. Um, I've worked with Drake, A Boogie with the Hoodie, PNB Rock, Russ, um, a lot of artists that you probably know. And what was the other question? Was it about TP? Stuff. not no i i'm gonna get i'm gonna get to tp but i i okay. just want to know how you you know how you started how you got started yeah so yeah that's how i got started and i've been doing that ever since okay cool um i i would think you'd probably all agree that uh love for music is is one thing that that binds not only you but but so many of us um uh, and that's how we get into um a career that is in some way um, inv involving music, whether it's as an artist or as a teacher or a promoter or a manager and, or a producer. And I, I just wonder, I get kids as a, as a teacher every year that, that uh, some of them very talented that uh, express an interest in, in, um, in going into music and going to college and um, majoring in music and uh, or studying music in some way and um, having done that myself and having um, followed a rather torturous path uh, over the course of uh, the last too many decades to mention um, I'm sometimes at a loss what to tell these 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 uh, young men and I, and I wonder you know uh, if if you guys have any thoughts about that? What what should I tell these guys? Uh, what should I tell a young man who comes to me and says, who, who's a musician, spe specifically musicians, because that's, who, uh, that's as a, a teacher, that's who I get. I get these young men who want to become, you know, famous musicians or, or at least have a career in music. What do I tell them when they express an interest in going to college and majoring in music? I really think that um first you should ask them like how far they really want to take it because there's like different levels to music you can just make music with friends or local people or you can take it to that global level or just like it just i think it depends on their, their drive for what they want to accomplish with music and they have to know that first to really get to where they want to go because i feel like if they don't have that established then they can get lost and just like the the music world yeah, I can kind of build on what Ness was talking about. Um, you know, there there are different levels to this. And, you know, being a famous artist or musician, um, it's one thing to say it, but you really, it's it's a lifestyle. You got to commit your life to it. You got to be ready to live on your friend's couch or live paycheck to paycheck or stay living at your parents' houses or live at your producer's house. Um, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Anyone that thinks that there is an overnight success, they really just don't see what's behind it. Um, you know, there's a team of people that do promotion, there's a manager, there's an attorney, um, you know, so if you really want to be a famous artist, 
Um, you really, you've got to put in the time and you got to put in the work and you got to commit your life to it. Um, as for going to college, you know, I know this is a, is a, a school thing. Um, I, I went to college for a year and I found my first job and I knew that this was the industry I wanted to be in. So I, I dove in head first, um, you know, and I was making less than minimum wage and kind of, I just dedicated my life to it and I grinded and I grinded until I got to where I wanted to be, which is, you know, still here. Um, but yeah, there's different levels to it. I would just tell, tell your students that if they really want to be a successful musician, kind of like what Ness said, there is definitely, definitely different levels. You can do it on a local artist and play at your local venues. But if you want to be an international superstar, you got to be really committed and got to, got to, you're going to get rejected multiple times. So, um, you know, you can't be afraid to fail, um, or at least be told no, and doors are going to get slammed in your face. And hopefully you can just find a window or a crack to, to dive into. Uh, right. Yeah. Still, still uh, I, if I if I might, I I just uh, follow up on the the idea of levels. Though I I think that it's probably true that uh, when they start out, they all believe they want to be famous. They want, and and it's not a question. You know, sometimes it becomes a question of there not being a clearly defined career path in this business. It, you know, I I in so many other uh, businesses. You know what to do. If you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school, you take the bar, you, you, you know, with music, it's so diffuse, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, as we all know, uh, it's not enough to want it really bad. And it's not enough to just, uh, you know, work at it, work at it, work at it, and do whatever it takes and sleep on couches. What you may do that and you might never, you might never break through and, and your ceiling might be the local music scene, right? Yep. And um, and so, you know, that's it, 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 I, I, I would I, I don't want to like mislead guys, you know, to, to, to say, well, if you really want it bad enough, you can do it yeah. um, because that's not always enough. You know, wanting it is not always enough. Sadly, if it were, you know, it, it's not. There's a lot of other uh, factors that come into success. There's, you know, there's timing there's luck there's your team there there are so many people involved and there are so many factors it's not just talent that's the other thing it's not just talent and it's not just desire but in terms of going to college for music I would say that um, classical musicians should go to college for music but rock pop uh, hip-hop country I wouldn't go to college for music. Um, if you wanted to be in the music industry, I think there are some good music industry courses now. And it's more, you know, in my day, as I say, most people came up through college radio. I think these days with, you know, blockchain and web 3.0 and all those sorts of things that there are, um, there are serious industry um, uh, developments, technological developments, particularly that are changing constantly, and we're sort of at a at a um, at a influx point. And and I feel that um, getting a leg up on those sorts of issues through a, a good college program would be beneficial if you're interested in the industry. But as a musician, I would actually suggest you go to college for something else and play your music as your passion because the only way you're actually going to be good and find an audience is if you're passionate and if, if you're not prepared to play when you're not making a lot of money off it then you don't love it enough to make a lot of money off it anyway so I would say go to college for something else and play as much as you can and if your your music or your band or whatever finds an audience and takes off, then you can put the college on, on pause, but it's always a good idea to have a plan B because it's not just raw talent or passion. There's, there's a lot of um, variables that are outside of yours or anybody else's control. The way the wind blows can change your uh, career trajectory. I just wanted to say one more thing about it because we, we, we live in a world where there's Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, all of this stuff, especially Instagram and TikTok, um, content, content, content. If you really want to be, be an artist and a musician, there's, there's avenues for you to just put stuff out. And you can't, like I said before, you, you can't be afraid to post something. And if it gets seven views, you take it off. Just keep posting and posting and posting. Create it and put it out. Create it and put it out. Um, you know, share it with your mom. Share it with your brother. Share it with your friends. And hopefully they share it or somebody 
somebody finds it and it might be something that they see your raw talent. You can, you can get a record deal off a of raw talent. You know, that does happen these days. Or maybe you put something out and all of a sudden someone uses it on TikTok and it's a 15 second clip for your song. That could yeah. go viral. You know, there, there are definitely different avenues now. So I would just say, create, 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 post, 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 put it out and don't be afraid. You know, just, just put it. Don't buy, don't buy, uh, 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 streams and don't buy numbers. It, people can see through it instantly. So don't ever let anybody talk you into paying for 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 them to goose your social media. It is so obvious. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you brought up Spotify because uh, Spotify um, for for musicians, you know, my generation, Spotify is is the evil empire in a way because uh, it doesn't pay musicians diddly squat frankly um the um uh and and we're living in a in a situation where it's harder and harder to make money as you guys know a lot better than me harder and harder to, to you know to sell records like saturday night fever will never sold you know went what double tw triple platinum i don't know back in the 70s we'll never see that level of uh record sales again uh are, are is um is the recording industry uh, viable still? Is it a viable path for for, uh, for for musicians, you know, to make a living? Can you make a living just making records anymore? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, is it's the, you know, in my experience, especially the last few years, and when I started at Atlantic, streaming wasn't even a thing, obviously. Um, and with it now, if your if your business or your label or as an, even as an independent artist, if you do it properly, Atlantic is, is making money. Um, you know, everything is up. Streaming is up every quarter, even through this pandemic, you know, profits are up. Um, you know, your audience is so much bigger. Um, you know, obviously for every record you would normally sell for a single, it takes about 1500 streams to equal that one sale. Um, but it's also reaching a, such a bigger audience. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely a viable um, profession for sure. Um, and record companies are making a ton of money. And I think it's a viable profession for a wider range of artists as well. I mean, you know, for, for indie rock artists, for example, you know, you used to have to, um, to find that music. You used to have, a re have to have a really good corner record store with a guy that shared your taste in music who could tell you what new records had been released and and in order to find them now you can it's you know with peer-to-peer -peer and and all that streaming you can find um your the artists that you like and find your tribe far more readily and i think that that's meant that for the smaller artists it's easier to actually find an audience that isn't going to make you rich and famous but can sustain you and, uh, you know, I think it, it was Wired magazine that, that a couple of decades ago um, wrote an article about the long tail, about how because of the, the, um, the, the narrow, um, not the small number of records that can be added to radio playlists in any given, given week, um, there used to be a very small number of artists who sold a lot of records and everybody else sold nothing. Now that curve has flattened a lot. It's not flat, but the 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 um, number of artists finding an audience and a big enough audience to to provide a modest living is much greater than it was twenty years ago. John, John, you would probably know this. Uh, um, have a unique uh, insight into this. Is radio a, a big deal now, as opposed to streaming? Is is uh, you know. As, as a radio guy, I want to I want to say that it's it's absolutely still you know just as popular as it once was. It's it's kind of a two part question. Um, you know, growing up, radio was obviously everything, and that's where people went to hear their new music. It was the first stop you went to um, to hear brand new records. Now it's it's dictated the other way. The the public tells us what records to work um, instead of us telling people what to listen to. So. When we put a when we put a record out, and actually Ness mentioned an artist earlier, a boogie with the hoodie, who was actually signed to Atlantic. Um, you know, he can put an album out, or he can put a single out, and we'll wait a couple of weeks before we take it to radio to see what the first week streams or second week streams 
um, before we even take it to radio and see if it's worth it. You know, if it streams 5 million, 10 million first week, like we're chasing it. And that's where people are hearing brand new music first. Radio now is a different avenue. Radio sees hits from streaming and radio extends the life of those records. Um, you know, streaming, you're turning through those records a lot quicker. Um, and those are kind of the tastemakers who are on Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, you know, even YouTube, a lot of YouTube. Um, and then, you know, when we see those numbers, we, we chase it at radio and then it just extends the life, you know, it could be months, you know, um, there's, there's artists like, like Ness mentioned before, a boogie, you know, we worked that he's a, he's a hip hop artist, but we got that record on, you know, urban radio, rhythmic radio, and even got so big that we were working at a top 40. So you're looking at a, a song that may have just lasted on streaming for a couple months, but ended up being on the radio for a full year. Right. Uh, that's interesting. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, Ness, how did you, um, when you started out uh, as a producer, how did you find uh, people to collaborate with? How did you find these collaborators? How did Drake hear about you or Boogie with a Hoodie? Well, first, like, I started locally, trying to just get my name out there, just giving the artists free beats so that I can just get my name out there. Also make how did you people. how did you do that? How did you give him free beats? Was did you have a like a SoundCloud or was it Bandcamp or something like that that you? Uh, I think it was mostly first at, from Facebook because I had like a lot of pe local people at Facebook, so I'll see people tweet or not tweet but post about I need beats or if you got some beats send it to me or people some people knew I just made beats so they'll send me email their email and I would just send them the beats, but. When I was in my freshman year in college is when I, I had my first major, like placement with a boogie. And with that, a friend from college he lived in New York City and he was playing like a song of a boogies. I didn't, I never knew about a boogie at the time. And he was playing it on uh, Snapchat. And I was like listening to him like, who is this? And he told me it's a boogie. So I just went to go search up his music. And I liked his, his music and he was kind of new and I saw his, his email and his Instagram bio. So I just sent him a few beats. And I think that same night he hit me back up and he said like, what's your number? And that's just how everything started from there. And then after we started working, we had a few songs together. Like I signed with them. And like, as he blew up, I was under his label, Highbridge label. And as he blew up, like my name got bigger because I was their only producer. So as he blew up, like my name got bigger and then like this other artist wanted to work with me as well. But me getting to Drake, it came through connections because when I was working with a boogie, other producers would come to me and a producer named Cam uh, Chef Pasquale, he had a, a connection with Drake and he hit me up saying that, but I didn't believe him at first because most people wouldn't believe like if you just say, I have a connection to Drake, but you really gotta just take chances in the music. like. What did I have to lose if I sent him a beat for Drake? So I actually did that and I found out that the, the beat that I gave him got placed. So it was just mostly through connections and using social media to get to who I need to, to get to. Well, that, that that's interesting. That kind of speaks to what John was talking about, about the, uh, you know, not, don't be afraid to just put it out there, right? Put it out there and, and uh, send it to people that you admire. Uh, send it to artists you admire. I, I think you know w that takes a that takes a lot of guts actually. But but um, but don't, you can't be uh, you can't be afraid you know for them to turn you down or even to ignore you. Which in, let's be be honest, a lot of times that's what's going to happen. But you never know. You know, like they may get back to you and 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 also networking, right? When you, I'll say that's that's a big part of it. Never Definitely. stop networking. Never, ever, ever stop networking. What, what form does networking take now in, in the internet age? It's exactly what Ness was talking about, really. Just like hit someone on the DM on Instagram or if you like something on TikTok. I mean, I'm not the biggest TikTok user in the world, but that's where records break now. Um, you just, you just got to network with everyone. Use your socials, you know, whether it's Facebook or commenting on a YouTube or subscribing to a YouTube, but yeah, Ness, Ness touched on it. It's, it's really a DM, um, you know, finding someone's email on their Instagram profile and just hitting them up. 
um, a question came in from Slade Mead. Um, Ness, can you share what it means to send a beat, to make a beat and send a beat? What Can you explain what a beat is? So a beat is really an instrumental, but it's, I guess that's like a new term for it. Um, and it's just composed of different sounds to create an arrangement. I can't really get too technical about it because I'm just, I just know based on like where I stand by in the music industry, like just make beats and, but to send a beat to artists, it's really just many different ways. Like I touched on uh, networking, sending them the DM, sending it to the email. And it's like a waiting game. You send them the beat and then you see if they respond. So most people won't respond. And the, the way you'll really find out if they use it is if like they tell you when they use it, after they use it, or you, you go to the artist's profile on Instagram and you see them like previewing a song with your beat. So it's like, it's not really a direct most of the time, especially if you, you're networking from online. But if you feel like the best way is to connect with people person, like on a person to person level, because like, the connection will always be there. Uh, so, yeah, speaking to Slay, use uh, FL Studio too, I think you said, or FL Studio, right? Mm -hmm. um that that's a for the uninitiated that's a uh music production so, uh, app or software that that allows you to use uh, um samples and uh um software instruments and drum machines etc to create your own um uh compositions really and i correct me if i'm wrong courtney but or ness but the but you guys use that. You'll you'll come up with a, a the, your beats. What you call beats are the instrumental background for for rappers, right? Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and Slade followed that up by, and I think that's interesting. I was going to ask myself that: Do you own that beat, or have you given? When, when a guy takes it and plays it, you find out he's using it. You know, with without telling you, is that have you given away your in, intellectual property? Um, I own it. You own the beat until you give away your exclusive rights. There's like lease rights and then there's exclusive rights. So the lease rights is you can sell that beat. It's usually way less than the exclusive rights. You can sell that beat to anybody. So let's say I sell the beat to you, but I can, with the lease, I can sell it to anybody else because I still own the beat. But if I give you exclusive rights, then that beat is yours now. I don't own it at all. So when I give album placements, it's like exclusive leases. So it's like more expensive than the, the regular lease. And like, if I send the beat to somebody and they, like I see them playing it online, like I don't, you gotta kind of like know when to be aggressive about things and when to just let things be because you don't want to start anything, especially if you're a small producer and say I send the beat to, to Drake and I see him play it on the story. Like you don't want to attack Drake for that. Cause like, that's going to help you more than like you're going to lose from that. So it's like about taking risks too and knowing when to do things like the right timing. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want, you don't want to um, pick a fight with someone who can really help you. Right. Definitely. Uh, I wonder, you know, speaking, we, we were talking about the love of the, of the music and everything. And I'm sure all of you, have have had uh, you know a lot of memorable experiences. Uh, what would uh, what would uh, what would you say is your mo most memorable experience so far in your career, um, Debbie? <laughs> Put you on the spot with that one, huh? Too too many to count. Yeah, um, yeah. There's been some, you know. I think always sort of. You know, meeting some of your musical heroes is, um, well, not always memorable in a good way. Sometimes it can be very disillusioning. But for me, actually, some of the most memorable experiences are um, funny shows that the band I used to manage did that, you know, you would expect to have been great and they were a total mess or the best ones were the ones that you thought were going to be a total mess because everything was going wrong. And they ended up being fantastic. Like um, we had one 
night that we were playing at the original knitting factory in New York, which was tiny and hot and, and some TV crew came in with all these huge spotlights and it was boiling in there. And there was sweat dripping off the band's jeans. They were so drenched and they were brilliant. And it was, you know, it could have just been under these terrible bright spotlights. It could have been a really bad show and really awful, but somehow um, they just, they just rose above it. And there was another uh, time in, um, in uh, Amsterdam when they were playing at a famous club called the Milky Way and the power went out and it was pitch black, no electric instru instruments and the lead singer just broke into an acoustic version of Elvis Presley's Trouble um, and the crowd just, it just made everybody just so um, supportive and happy and and it, it just turned into a, a you know when the power came on the rest of the band just joined into this Elvis cover that they'd never played before in their lives and it just turned into a really magical show out of sort of disaster um, so those are I think for me some of the most memorable times when things that you think are going really pear-shaped um, suddenly um, blossom into something unexpected right what about you, Courtney? Any memorable experiences? You're 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 a young guy, so <laughs> yeah, I definitely have a lot. Um, I think going to shows and hearing like the music that you produce for, and just seeing everybody sing the lyrics, and that's like an amazing feeling, especially when there's like more than thousands of people. I think uh, so for the Drake song when I I knew that. I had the placement with Drake like a year before it dropped and I was told I couldn't say anything about it. But then Drake previewed the song that I produced on like Twitter and every, he, he previewed it at a concert for like a, as a snippet. And like it just streamed everywhere on Instagram, Twitter. And like I was in college at the time and like I was just on Twitter and I saw it and I like I tapped the video and it was my song and I was just like, <laughs> like. <laughs> I, I never heard it. And that was oh, my first man. time hearing it. So it was just like unreal. Yeah, it must have been great. What about you, John? Um, I've been really lucky. Um, I've I have stories that I can't tell on here um, for sure. Uh, oh, come I, on, tell them. Oh, you don't want to hear them. I, I, my parents are on here. Um, <laughs> they know the stories, though. Um, you know, I, 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 I've really been lucky. Um, I've had some really fun late nights with some artists. I've had some really early mornings with some artists. Um, you know, Ed Sheeran is, I don't know if he's my favorite artist that I've ever worked with, but he, I would say it's a 1A and a 1B with, with, with probably Charlie Puth. Um, but, you know, just basically Ed's whole career, um, you know, we had to beg people to play Ed's songs on the radio. You know, he's a little redheaded kid from the UK singing a song that a lot of radio stations didn't want to play. Um, so, you know, we'd wake up really early in the morning, flying from city to city, driving from station to station, um, begging people to play his music. He was playing conference rooms and radio stations for five or six people for radio programmers that didn't want to play his music. Um, and you just saw it kind of grow and grow and grow, um, you know, over the years, I think we started in 2012 or 2013 and, you know, a year and a half ago or two years, he just finished the, the biggest biggest grossing tour of all time, you know, more than the Beatles, more than you two. Um, you know, and I, I honestly, I consider him a, a friend. Um, you know, he's, he's met my family, um, my dad, my mom, my wife, my kids, my son gets his own dressing room at his, at his concerts. Um, you know, so any, any moment with Ed has been a great one. Um, you know, on the early days when he was opening for Ed Sheeran, I say early days, they were doing arenas. Um, you know, my wife and I were on this tour with him for a bunch of days and we happened to be in Orlando, Florida for, for a two nighter. And, you know, he was like, Hey, I want to go to one of the parks. Can you set it up? So we set it up for, you know, like universal and, you know, Taylor ended up wanting to take the whole tour to Disney that day. And we went to Disney, you know, and we were riding the rides with Taylor Swift. My wife ended up on TMZ um because we weren't supposed to ride the rides twice and she was like hey we're not to wait in the line so we're gonna ride the ride twice um so you know the headline basically read taylor swift and ed sheeran hold up the lines at, at disney um but you know i honestly any moment i got to spend with ed is is one of my favorites and 
Um, you know, similar with Charlie Puth, you know, we got to see Charlie start in a similar way. Um, you know, he, he started a little bit differently. His first song was one of the biggest songs of all time with See You Again um, and, and Wiz Khalifa. So that obviously was like a monster start for him. Um, but, you know, any moment I've gotten to spend with Charlie, but the, the, the more specific, like the number one, and I don't know if this is a career defining one, but um, we just finished the Jingle Ball show in Miami and we had another gig up in Orlando and it happened to be my grandmother's 95th birthday. So on the way, uh, I was like, hey, if you want a home cooked meal, we can stop at my grandmother's. I'd love to say happy birthday to her. Um, so me, Charlie and his tour manager stopped at my grandmother's house and uh, my brother happened to be there to celebrate. My cousin happened to be there. My dad happened to be there. So, you know, Charlie Booth was singing happy birthday to my grandmother on her 95th birthday. <laughs> So I'd say that's that's a pretty memorable one too. But honestly, I can I can write a book on on I'm really lucky. I got I got stories for days. Um, well, maybe, maybe you should write a book. I just recorded my first episode of the podcast today, so you guys can watch out for that one. Very cool. We'll share that with us. Uh, share, share that address. Uh, someone asked, it was Ed Sheeran's role in the movie yesterday written specifically for him, or did he audition for the show? I'm pretty sure he he, he that was written for him. Cool. Oh, Chris, you're uh, muted. Oh, Chris, I think you're still muted. This is not working well, so I'm just going to leave it open, and hopefully, there's not going to be any uh, any uh, feedback. Uh, some questions that that came in previous to uh, prior to the the show. Um, someone asked, uh, are, are recording, con re recording contracts relevant anymore? And I, I suppose they mean since every, anyone can make a record in the bedroom now um, and put it out and put it on the various uh, outlets, um, do, do, are recording contracts relevant anymore? I mean, I, I, I know the, the answer to that question. If you're signed Atlantic, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's relevant. But, but I mean, what do you guys think about that? Did you hear me? I was going to let Debbie take this. Oh, okay. I was afraid maybe I had uh, muted myself again. Yeah, I think even for even at an indie rock um, level that, you know, the, the even like the, the writers at Pork and, and uh, Brooklyn Vegan and so on, they're, they're not, they're, you know, they're getting hundreds and hundreds of emails every week and they're not going to listen to all those links and so on. And so even for them, having a someone that they trust who is a um, funnel is helpful. And that's the role that, that I think record companies play a lot. They're, they're like gatekeepers, they're the connectors, they're, um, they're part of that network. And of course, they're, they're helping to finance the recording and so forth as well, um, and the tour and the marketing and everything. But it's not just about the money. They actually still, um, you know, if you find a record company that you really connect with that uh, um, that will has connection to your audience and and the um, and major media outlets for your audience, then um, it, it's an important um, interface between everybody in their bedroom noodling away on 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 their iPhone and people actually reaching a level that um, people like Pitchfork would want to write about. Mm -hmm. Let alone you know, Rolling Stone, etc. I can build on that a little bit too. Um, you know, you said, you know, signing to a, a label like Atlantic, obviously it's, it's still a good idea or lucrative, uh, but you know, signing to a label like Atlantic, we pride ourselves on artist development. So if you are getting a deal with Atlantic, you know, you're, you're a priority no matter what level you're at. Um, but it's a machine, you know, it's not just a radio promotion department. When you get signed, you have A&R, artist, rep, artist and repertoire, you know, they're, they're helping you develop your, your music. So like, Ness knows about that, you know, like it's not just it's not just a beat, it's it's a beat and then it gets sent to an artist and then that artist records over it and then it gets put out and then it gets put on an album and that album is then, you know, promoted by a marketing department, a publicity department. We have a TV sync department. Um, we have an influencer department and a digital department and obviously the radio promotion department. So when you get signed to a major label, you know, you get signed to a machine. 
Um, and you know, they're, they're behind you hundred percent, you know, cause they're not going to sign you if they don't want to make money off of you. So I, I think it's still absolutely worth it to, to get a sign with a, a label. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, there's a certain, there's room for expertise even today, I guess. Right. Yeah. And I, I will say though, like obviously independent is, you know, back in the day, you know, being an independent artist, it was really a struggle to, to make it, but more and more often now you could, you could be an independent artist as well and, and still be successful. But, you know, obviously I'm biased. I would say if you can get a record deal, you take the record deal. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, Ness, uh, how does a producer, and I'm going to ask Debbie about this too, how does a producer, um, do producers get record contracts like rappers do or like, uh, you know, or like bands do, do they get record contracts or are you, are you a, essentially a free agent just working whoever, for whoever wants to use your stuff? Yeah, so right now I'm, I'm a free agent, but before I was signed to as an in-house producer. So I was signed to Hybrid's label and then Hybrid's label, that's a boogie's uh, label. They were partnered with Atlantic. So I think it's kind of the same, but it's like different requirements for the different creators, like the artists, producers, engineers. But yeah, that's it really. Uh, Debbie, I, I, I didn't even know that, that uh, like record producers had or needed managers. And this, this is new to me. <laughs> I, I, I guess I've been living in a cave or something. But Well, I, see, my producers are not like Ness. Um, they can write. Um, they do sometimes write. They do a lot of arranging. But the way I usually explain it is that the producers that I manage are more like a film director and I'm like the producer and the agent. So they go in with different bands all the time. Um, sometimes they'll do two or three records with the same band and then the band will move on to a different producer. But what they do is they, um, they before they start recording, they, they work with the band on their songs, which is similar to the way a um, director would work on a script. So they, you know, they'll, whether it's saying something like, um, you know, have you tried playing this half a bit slower? It's like you're rushing it or, you know, you've really buried the, the hook. The hook is in your middle eight and that really should be your chorus or, you know, uh, th there could be all sorts of ways that they look at helping the band rearrange the song. You know, the band up until that point have just been playing playing the the, music, the song amongst themselves in a, in, a, in a practice room. And so that sort of fresh ears, professional ears, helps them fine tune the music before they get into the studio. Then once they get there, you know, these guys are used to playing together and in front of an audience. And all of a sudden they're playing individually in a room on their own with headphones on. And they're somehow supposed to produce the most inspired performance of their lives in an incredibly sterile foreign environment. So they're the producer as the director as well. He's trying to elicit, and they all have different tricks for eliciting um, a really great performance from musicians who are playing in a very uninspired, sterile environment, which they only do very occasionally, so they never get used to it. And then, of course, there's the sound of each instrument, which the producer oversees, the, the recording of each instrument and the vocal, what mics to use, what amps to use, what instruments to use. Um, and then there's the mixing. Um, uh, most of my producers mix as well. Um, 90% of the time they mix the records they produce. Sometimes a different mixer comes in, but the producer is still involved in making sure that all those instruments are placed um, in a way that works three-dimensionally. So that's what they do. And while they're in the studio with a band doing that, they are not listening to the 50 demos that came in. That's my job. <laughs> so I'm the one that that goes through those 50 demos and says, these are the two that are really interesting that you, I think you'll like, um, or these are the bands that are, you know, I think you'll connect with personally, or this is the band that it is working in the kind of direction where you want to go as opposed to the three records that you did two years ago that the other demos are all 
trying to um, replicate. So it's a matter of having a knowing them well, knowing their personality, knowing their style, knowing whether they'll want to push or experiment with a band or um, coddle an insecure band, and uh, you know what they're like, um, what what they like musically. Um, and where they want to go musically, because usually there's such a lag on what's been released that the stuff coming in for them is a sort of time capsule of what they were doing several years ago. So keeping their career moving forward, keeping them interested, and um, and then I do all the contracting and record, booking studios and all that sort of stuff. And my producers are paid in advance against a record royalty. So. Um, and I get a commission on that. So they, they all have, they generally get like um, old fashioned three points or, or a quarter of the or 20 to 25% of the artist's royalty. And that's how they're paid. Yeah, I, I, uh, I you know, when I, when I was a kid and learning about this kind of stuff, I always, I tended to associate certain um, producers with certain record labels, you know, like, uh, Arif Marden with Atlantic, for instance, you know, and um, but but your guys are essentially freelance guys, then, right? And do they contract with? Do you, do you work out contracts with with labels, or or do they work directly with bands? No, they work. Well, it depends. If the band is signed to a label, um, often the label will approach us. But these days with the internet, the, uh, you know, it's usually the musicians that approach us. And then if they're working with a, a label and the label's paying the bills, then it has to be a sort of agreement that, um, that this producer is the right producer for them to be working with. Um, but if it's an independent artist, they'll just make that decision independ independently. I mean, you know, people like the Foos don't answer to a record label anymore. Um, so it's, you know, it, it varies. Um, there's sort of a middle ground where um, where the record companies make the decisions, but at the bottom end and the top end, it tends to be the artist. Okay, okay. Uh, I got I got a question here uh, that that I promise you this is not my question, but it says, "What's the oldest new artist you've ever come across?" Or I should say, new talent performer you've come across. That's a tough one for me, especially like on a recent level. I think our artists are getting younger and younger because of social media, because we're discovering artists on YouTube and Instagram and specifically TikTok. So honestly, I don't know. I feel like our artists are definitely getting signed in their younger 20s or even younger than that, um, mid 20s. I can't like some of our rock bands, maybe a little bit older, um, but it's it's I can't think of like a old artists getting a new deal um, lately or even really since I've been at Atlantic. That, that doesn't surprise me. Um, when, when, when it comes to uh, another question that came in, when it comes to, uh, um, well, what, what are the pros and cons for an artist to be on, under contract for a label? Uh, now we've already talked about the, the, the pros for John, uh, for John with with Atlantic, he he went into great detail about that, and it's the the uh, the, the positives are manifest. But what about um, what about someone who's 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 offered a, a deal with with a you know somewhat marginal label that's not you know that doesn't offer them a lot of money up front, and that's um, that you know may not it's it's kind of like a flip of a coin maybe in in, in the artist's mind whether he should sign it. Uh, what don't do you do it. <laughs> don't do, don't it? do it. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't feel that you're really lucky to be there and that you've found your your people, and this is the label that has other artists that you love and you relate to, and that they'll understand you and and they know your audience, and um, that you know if if you don't feel that connection, then just go it alone until you find a, a label that does connect with you like that I, I wouldn't you know there is more flexibility for artists to hold off I don't think you as John said I don't think if you offered a good deal by a good label you don't turn it down um but if it's a, if it's a you know if it's an, an indie label that's that's got a niche that that is your niche 
then it doesn't matter if they're not huge, but there's got to be a good connection and a good reason for you to be um, committing your, your future work to them. And, you know, I think at the indie le level, it's important to always make sure that you, you know, you get your rights back, that you've got a reversion on your, on your masters and so on, so that you're not signing your life away. You're muted, Chris. I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> By reversion of rights, you mean, you know, a, a fixed a time limit on how long they have the right yeah. to, to issue the music, right? Uh, what about you, Ness? You were with a label and now you're not. Uh, have you noticed a difference? Is, there, is, there a, is one better than the other? I mean, I think they both have their pros. Uh, when I was with the label, I went in as a, I'm just tell the, like the full story. Like I, I went in, not really knowing what music labels were, the the business about music. So, like I kind of signed for a bad a bad deal. I signed with Hybrid for two years for five thousand dollars. Now that don't, doesn't seem like a lot now, but like the way I've grown up, I always had everything I wanted, two parents, all that. So, to me, it's like I never made, I never had a job, so I never made money for myself. So five thousand dollars to me in college is like. Wow, I could do a lot with this. I lived off five thousand dollars for two years, but the benefits really is like having like a team, like talented people with you that you work well with, making hits with, like you feel comfortable with creating with. But what I didn't learn coming into it was that you should have also like a personal relationship with them too, because like I had a business relationship with them, but the personal relationship was like. It wasn't there because we come from two different backgrounds and it's like every time I got around them, they were into different things that I wasn't into and we just didn't connect. So just after a while, it's like the relationship faded and being like a free agent, like I love it because I learned from my last uh, encounter with being in the, a label. So now I know what to look out for and it's just giving me a lot of time just to like recreate my sound and figure out what I, I want to go to the future. Uh, I We got a question uh, from, from a listener uh, that uh, her, her, my oldest grandson sings and plays the guitar. He's a senior in college, would like to get into the music industry. How? Don't, don't everyone jump in for you know i i think we kind of answered that earlier with the put out the content put out the content put out, i mean no one has the same journey so like just saying how does somebody get in the music business or how do you become an artist I, 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 you're an artist and you just make your craft and you make your music and you put it out like yeah I, the only way to answer it is just create and put it out and it, it depends on the genre as well it also depends on what they mean by he wants to get into the music industry. Does he want to be a musician or does he want to be um, working at a record company or does he want John's job? Uh, you know, they're, they're different routes um, depending on, you know, the, the type of music and, and what they mean by the music industry, whether they mean he wants to be a musician or, and, you know, is he in a band or is he noodling in the bedroom on his own? Is he primarily writing songs or, you know, does he write his own material or is he a cover artist or, you know, it, it, it very much depends on um, what sort of music and, and what they mean by music industry. I think it also depends on like your mindset and also how realistic you are with yourself. Like if you, like I know it's not always the best to compare with other people of music, but if you want to be in the music industry, whatever genre, you got to hear what they're producing and kind of line it up to you and what you're creating and be like, does this fit or like, is this the right quality? And with the mindset, I think if you're determined enough, you can really make anything happen in your life. But like your determination has to be backed up with like the hard work to get there. You can't just be like, oh, I want this, this, uh, this fame or whatever. And you're not working hard to get it. You have to really put the work in to get everything that you want. It's not just gonna happen. No, like you if, you, if you just set a goal and you're focused on the goal and not everything in between it, you're never going to reach that goal. You got to work for everything to achieve that goal. So, you know, just saying you want to be an artist and then be, you know, like super successful and that be also what is your definition of success? Is it everyone hearing your music and, 
you know, there's, there's so, we said it before, there's so many different levels, but if you set a goal and only focus on the goal and don't focus on all the work and everything it takes to get to that goal, you're, you're just not going to reach it. Do you, do you think it's helpful to set short-term goals, interim goals on your way to your ultimate goal? hundred um, percent. I wanted to ask um, a Ness, uh, you, you're working with other artists now. Do you have any ambition to uh, to just do your own music? Say, say you wanted to do uh, just an all instrumental album that that didn't have any vocals, or that did, or, or or you wanted to produce a record with the with the um, the rappers that you wanted to work with, and you had your pick. You know, do you have an amb ambitions in that in that regard? I think I did before, but now I'm kind of like. There's so much new things going on in the world, and I don't think I really resonate with the music that's being produced now. So it's like I stopped listening to a lot of music, and now I'm just more to trying new things. Like I'm trying to live outside of like the music world because I feel like with me, if I start something, like I'm just stuck on it. So like I'll make beats all day, and I feel like experiencing new things helps me create a new sound. Like listening to different ethnic background music and all of that is like inspiring me to create something new. So like I, I've definitely put out new things like artist wise. And I've been thinking about doing instrumental uh, tapes and stuff, but I'm just trying to flow with the times and trying to figure out what's right right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, someone so, uh, ask someone else. Uh, there were a couple questions in the Q&A. Oh, okay. Um, one is, is there a particular college in the Northeast that is best for a music production degree? If any of you know that. I know about Berkeley and Fulso, which I don't know. I think Berkeley is in New York City or somewhere. Uh, Berkeley's in Boston and Full Sail's oh. in Orlando. Full, full Sail's a, a good school for sure. A huge for florida um, what was that again full sale university in orlando oh, yeah i get emails from there okay that's a broad spectrum too you know that's where tv radio uh producing it uh entertainment film all that stuff full sales a, a great school for sure and in the northeast syracuse is good yeah. for i have a ton of co-workers that went to syracuse for sure that's a big one i i think probably more and more uh, major universities are, are getting into the the uh, the production aspect. I know at TP even this year I, I uh, started a I uh, I built a, a little uh, music a studio with with you know a, a top of the line uh, Mac and all the the software and it's full of like everything because I got guys that want to produce like like Cor like Nest does and. Um, they they didn't have an outlet before. I mean, they did have they had their own laptops, but I want to make sure they have a um, you know a top flight uh, gear to to make it happen. So we've got a nice little. Uh, uh, it, it, I, I hesitate to call it a studio because it's ju it's a single room right now. Uh, but I'm I would eventually like to get it wired up, you know, to where we could get a you know bring live bands in as well. I got a question, Chris. I, I feel like I saw on the TP Instagram that there was a student this year that um, that got a deal with Internet Money Records um, and produced a record that went kind of viral. I, I can't remember who the student was, but you know, went on a. I think I I think I know Cooper. who Miss Vangrove. Could you could you? Uh... Um, yes, that's actually he's probably listening to this tonight. Um, that's my son uh, Cooper, who. <laughs> yeah, he he does what Ness does. He creates beats. And um, his beat got he got connected um, with uh, the artist that did Corvette Corvette, and yeah, so he wrote the music for that. All over the NFL, you know, they did the dance and everything. That was a, yeah. that was a huge deal and, for sure. And TikTok is what made that go viral, right? I mean, that's an example of like this whole new wave of, you know, getting you know your music out there and 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 recognized. So yeah, yeah. Tell and he and Ness have connected, I think, now yeah. on Instagram or some other social media. So yeah, that, that was huge. I mean, I, obviously, I knew that record before I read that. And when I when I saw that, I was like, oh my god, this is a TV student. I missed one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll have to get you guys all. We we'll have to get you guys all together. I hit him up on Instagram. He ghosted me. He ghosted me. 
Perfect. <laughs> Talk about a, a third wheel. I, I, last year, uh, Ms. Vengrove, uh, Kate asked me, uh, you should, you should, would you talk to Cooper, my son? He, he, he's really into music, but he's shy and he's, you know, and so I think I, I sat next to him at lunch one day and I talked to him a little bit about it. And um, little did I know that he, he would soon surpass me in terms of notoriety. Uh, he doesn't need me, I guess, so. I still want to get him connected in there with the with the music at the school. I'm hoping that with his senior project, we can we can make something happen. So well, well we, got gear, with, we got the gear. We got the gear. Did he sign a deal with Internet Money Records? What? Did he sign a deal with with Internet Money Records? Is he that did. Right? He did. I don't believe he's with them currently. I'm not up on all the latest. My husband is, but yeah, he he did. He was signed with them, um, and I'm not sure that you know what everything how it's all you know it is right now, but yeah. yeah. So um, for all you students out there, it can happen to you. You got Ness, we got Cooper. Uh, it's, it can happen. Okay. Yeah, John at Atlantic Records. And... Right, you're exactly, John, John, you know, yeah. 2001, a grad of TP. Um, it's, it's, it's hard, it's a hard path, but it can, you know, it can do, it can be done and you can do it, uh, but it, it takes a lot of work. A lot of work and and um you can't be shy you can't be shy right you got to get out there and uh, and put yourself out there i think that's that's one of the things i've gotten from this that you really have to you have to push yourself because if you if you sit back and wait for it to come come to you it's not gonna happen definitely well, we're just about at the eight o'clock mark. So I um, just want to thank all of you. I don't know if there's anything else that anybody would like to add in any of the panelists. Um, but I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. It's great to have you with us and just hear your insights into this profession. I know I took so much away from this and I know our audience did as well. Um, so thank each of you. And thank you, Chris, for, for hosting tonight and moderating the conversation. Um, and just a little programming note, we hope that everyone will join us next Wednesday as well for our next Pride Perspectives, uh, which will be a toast to our retiring faculty. We actually have a number of faculty retiring, uh, which is very bittersweet, but um, we will be toasting Ned Reed, uh, Debbie and Dave Karate, Van Metcalf, and Billy Casson. So we hope you'll join us next week for that. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and have a fantastic evening. Thanks, thank Brad. you. Nice meeting all you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.